right. Hey, let's have a little fun before we jump in here. Who here is a snorer? Who here knows their spouse is a snorer? People, I can literally see people elbowing people right now. This is awesome. Let's figure out how started off good. We'll fix your marriage in 30 minutes. Let's see if we can do this. Who here, you, you're okay with leaving dishes in the sink at night? Anybody you're okay with that? You weird people. Good Lord. Let the Lord touch you. I can't go to sleep. Who here, you've got to have an empty sink when you wake up? Is it just me? A couple crazy people. Here we are. It's like, look, I don't want to wake up to dishes. Awesome. Well, hey, this is, a, this is a great series we've been working through. And actually, I want to give a shout out uh, to Life Church, Pastor Craig Rochelle. They're actually the ones who created a lot of the content that we're sharing throughout this month. And they make these resources available. And so we're thankful that we can utilize uh, everything. And uh, it's just been a great, great few weeks together. And we're not done. We're on part three today. And next week, we're going to finish this thing up and it's going to be a great time. And also, if it's your first or second time here, before you leave, head over to the Connect Corner. We want to put a gift in your hands to say thank you for being our guest today. So I, I'm excited for this opportunity because I get to preach on uh, on something that's real unique. Um, honestly, I want you to really stay with me over the next 30 minutes because it's real easy for us to check out when we talk about what we're going to be talking about today. I've had the privilege to officiate uh, a handful of weddings um, in, in my time, like I'm old, in my time, right? In my, in my 30 years of existence. My birthday's next month, by the way. So I'll be 31. I'll be in my 30s, I can finally say. Um, so I, I've had the opportunity, and in a couple months I got another wedding coming up, and later this year. And, and every time I meet with couples that were getting ready to, to get married, I like to spend a few weeks with them. We go through some resources together and really just make sure, hey, Yes, your wedding day is going to come, but then it's going to go, and we're talking about marriage. We're talking about that lifelong covenant that you're going to make. And there's a few things that I've never heard any couple express during the time of us getting together. I, I've never sat across the table and I've said, hey, what are your dreams and your goals for your marriage? And they said, well, pastor, our hope is that we can just overspend uh, we would like to be in debt. We're really looking forward to money fights. Uh, we're going to put everything on the credit card, and then we're going to see how it works out for us. I've never heard that before. I I've never heard anybody express, well, you know, I'm hoping that I can, I can pick up an addiction to pornography. Uh, it can really impact the intimacy of our marriage. Um, I can begin to hate my spouse and despise him or her. I never heard that. I've never heard someone express to me, well, my goal is I'm going to start off with small lies, and then if I, can, if I can figure those out, I'll get to bigger lies, and then I'm hoping I can just deceive and crush the person that I'm going to make a commitment to on my wedding day. I've never heard someone say, I just hope I can get so busy, my life can get so wrapped up in my hobbies and my interests, and I have my thing, and she has her thing, and I spend my time in the garage, and she, she spends hers somewhere else, and, and we make our whole life around our kids, and, and we focus on their schedules, their needs, and we drive them here and there and all of that, so that at some point, I wake up next to this stranger and say, who are you? Have you been here the whole time? <laughs> never heard anybody say that. And nobody nudge anybody right now or raise your hand. You could just nod at me. How many know that those are real stories that take place all the time, right? Come on, those are real examples of marriages that end up somewhere, but nobody starts off saying, we want to go there. And yet, for some reason, marriages end up there. Why? Because you've got to have a vision for your marriage. That's what this whole series is about. You've got to have a vision for your life. You've got to have a vision for your relationships. Because if you don't, you're just going to drift and you're going to end up somewhere. And at some point, married or not, a year from now, five years, ten years, whatever it is, you're going to think, how did I get here? And the way you got there is by not having a vision, by not having a plan. Scripture says, without a vision, people perish. And so our hope for you as we've been praying and preparing for this month is that you would be so inspired to say, I've got to have a vision for my marriage. I've got to have a vision for my life. I've got to have a vision for my relationships. We need God vision. We need God goals. And so that's really what these four goals are. I'm going to show them to you, and then we are going to say them together. But we've decided that we are going to be Christ-centered we're going to be mission-driven. Today I'm talking about being devil-kicking, right? We're going, to, we're going to go into some spiritual warfare stuff today. And then next week we're going to finish up with being covenant-keeping. So let's just say these out loud so loud that the people on our online family can hear it. All right, so let's do this. We are Christ-centered, mission-driven, devil-kicking, covenant-keeping. One more time. We are Christ-centered, mission-driven, devil-kicking, covenant-keeping. 
Sounds like they believe it, Joe. Man, who he said it with some gusto there. We're excited about this. So today we're talking about this. We are devil kicking. We are going to be devil kicking. And, and, and I'm excited to preach this because today we're going to talk a lot about spiritual warfare. We're going to talk about the enemy. If you were here, we just sang a song earlier, what the enemy meant for evil. Okay, well, who's the enemy? We're going to talk about that. And I'm telling you, I've been praying so much, honestly, praying even more than preparing for this message Because I know as we discuss this content, it's going to be so easy for you to just check out and say, this is crazy, this is old-fashioned, this can't be real. The the enemy actually wants to be at work in that moment and pull you away from God. That's, That's what I believe. And so I'm asking you to lean in with me as we explore the truth of Scripture together. Before we get to Scripture, I want to read from The Art of War by Sun Tzu. I was looking all over Google to figure out how to pronounce his name. I don't know. I'm saying Sun Tzu. I'll probably say Sun Tzu at some point. It's like General Tao Chicken. Anyone know? I don't know how to say it. I just asked for it. This is, this is what it says. If you know the enemy and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. And if you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. So this is a popular quote from a popular book, right? Anyone here ever read it? I truthfully haven't. But I knew this quote, right? I, I knew this quote. I was like, there's something in, in the world about knowing your enemy and knowing yourself. And I Googled it, right? But, but really, the heart of this quote is, if you know your enemy, you know yourself, hey, you're going to have victory. If you only know one of those parties, yourself or the enemy, every time you win, you'll also lose. And if you don't know either, the author suggests you'll never Win. So I actually want to work off of this when it comes to spiritual warfare, when it comes to you and I engaging with our enemy. So there's going to be three knowings. I'm going to add a third one that Sun Tzu didn't have in there. Or I'm going to add a third that there's three knowings that you and I need to know if we are to be devil kicking. If you are to have a marriage that says, no, I'm not going to let the enemy get into this thing. So the first knowing is no the enemy. You've got to know who the enemy is. And maybe this is new. You're saying, I didn't think there was an enemy. What are you talking about? What, What is this enemy? Well, if you are in Jesus today, if Jesus is your savior, if you have confessed your sin to him, you are saved, you you put your faith in him, well, welcome to the battlefield. You've got an enemy who's not too happy with the decision that you've made to say, I'm putting my faith in Jesus. Paul gives it to us this way in Ephesians. Put all of God's armor on so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of your spouse, of your boss, of your neighbor. No, no, no. He says, put it all on because you've got to stand firm against the devil. Well, who's he? He goes on. He says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world. See, I want you to understand at the front of this, if we were to be devil kicking, and if you were to have a life where you are not succumbing in battle, where you are not defeated, you've got to identify the enemy of your life, of your soul. And no, it's not your spouse. I know at times you may feel like, hey, we've been going at it, We've been having fight seasons. Fight seasons? Anybody? Just, just your pastor? Okay, we, my wife and I have had fight seasons, right? Where it's like, man, it just feels like every little thing is getting under our skin. It feels like we just can't, we can't connect, right? And in that moment, it's so easy for you to look at the person next to you, the person you have entered covenant into with, and say, well, you're the reason my life is, you're the reason why I'm so angry all the time. You're the reason why I'm so frustrated. No, get this. This is the truth of scripture. The enemy of your soul is not your spouse. If you are in Christ, the enemy of your soul is the devil. What we've done in culture is we've kind of reduced the devil to a fat dude with a pitchfork, right? Remember the cartoons, the little guy on this shoulder, angel on this shoulder, or we've kind of just reduced, no, that can't be real, that can't be real, that's, that's nonsense. Okay, for our context today, I want you to lean into this. The scripture says you have an enemy, and then he's coming after you. And that his plan, according to Jesus, is that he's got visions for your life and for your marriage. It's not to be Christ-centered. It's not to be mission-driven. His vision for your marriage is to steal, to kill, and destroy. That is his goal for your life. That is his goal for your marriage. 
See, maybe you're struggling in your relationships right now and you do feel frustrated and you do feel upset and you do feel angry and you're wondering why the person you said I do to is no longer that person and you're constantly kind of hitting heads with each other and things aren't working out and all of that is the surface stuff that you're seeing but I believe according to scripture what's really going on is there is the unseen, there is the darkness There is this enemy that is just whatever he can do to get in there and to try and cause division, right? Joe preached this message on being mission-driven, on having one vision. Well, if the enemy can get in, if he can sneak his way, we're going to talk about how he does that. If he can get in, that's his goal. See, imagine if you got an alert on your phone. You ever get one of those alerts that you didn't plan for, like the loud siren alerts? You're like, Apple, why are you waking me up in the middle of the night? Because there's strong wind. I don't know. Like, what is happening here? Right? One of those alerts. So you get one of those alerts on your phone, and the alert says, a murderer or a thief was just released from prison. And Adam, he's coming for you. He's been, he found your Facebook. He knows where you live. He's stalking you. He's coming right after you. Okay, so what are you going to do when you get that alert that there is an enemy coming for you? I know what you're going to do. Right? You're going to bar your windows. You're going to install a security system. You're going to buy a dog that bites. Let me clarify. Not a chihuahua. At this point, no. I'm getting the biggest dog I can find, right? You're going to, you're going to do whatever. You're going to tell all of your neighbors, hey, be on the lookout if this person comes. You're going to warn your family members. You're going to pray if you're a believer. You're, you're going to do whatever it takes because you know that there is an enemy that's coming for you. You've been warned. So today, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to warn you to say, listen, The words of Peter. In fact, say these first four words with me. Stay alert. Let's say it again. Stay alert. Let's say these next two words. Watch out. Stay alert. Watch out. Why should I do that? He says, for your great enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And I know there's a lot of front-end buy-in that I'm looking for this morning for you to just kind of let go of some of the cultural ideas to say this can't be real, this can't be real. Just lean into this. Trust God on this. And it's not about fear. We're going to talk about that. Today is not a message where I stand up and say, the devil's coming for you. I got to do it with an accent or something. I should be wiping my head with a hanky the whole time. Pound this. Okay, that's not this kind of church. For some of you, you're guests, and you're like, I've never heard the pastor speak. I'm so excited. Oh, great, the pastor spoke. This is awesome. Where's Joe? Where's Pastor Amy? Because I get up here and preach about the devil. It's just how it, how it fell for this series. Right? But, but I, I do, I, I'm telling you, I want you to understand this truth. I want you to understand the truths of Scripture that says that there is an enemy, and his plan for your life and your marriage and your relationships is to steal, kill, and destroy. And so we are told, watch out. And the reason why you and I can sit here and say, but I've never seen him. I've never seen any of this. Because the devil's not going to show up and announce his coming. (laughs) Here I am, Mr. Satan, at your service. You can call me Lucifer, right? He's not going to do that. I've got some plans for you. I'm going to, no, it's going to be way sneakier than that. In fact, I want you to write this down. The devil often attacks with distractions and seductions. That's really his two big tactics. If I can distract you, and if I can seduce you, if I can pull you off course, and if I can entice you to come over here. Let's talk about these distractions. I mean, go back to the garden. It was the first thing that he did when it came to Adam and Eve, who were united in mission. He distracted them by something they were said, don't touch. Let me just pull you aside here. Check out this fruit. Distraction. King Solomon, the third king of Israel, was a man who was supposed to lead people, and he got distracted by trying to please people. He made it more about himself, more about what can I do, how can I get more attention. Think think about this. Judas had the same opportunities as the other 11 disciples. Saw the same miracles. Ate the same bread and fish. Was a part of the same teachings, but he got distracted by money. Little distractions. If the enemy can just distract us just a little bit and pull us off course. There's a book in the Old Testament. It's called the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon. 
Uh, if you're under 18, don't read this, okay? Just disclaimer, this is once you're married, okay? This is, some, this is some marriage literature. Married men, if you don't know what to say to your wife, you might get some stuff from here. Although I don't recommend it because he goes in and he says to her, your hair is like a flock of goats. I personally, I don't know. Ladies, if you want that, we'll say it. He says, your neck is like the Tower of David. Again, I don't know that this works, but apparently in whatever BC, those were some good compliments, right? So he's talking to his woman about her goat hair and all this, and then he switches gears. And he switches gears, and he gets really serious. It's actually, it's actually a great read because they're sending letters to each other, and the whole premise of the book is to show how beautiful marriage is and to show how beautiful sex is in the confines of marriage. So they're waiting, and, and he, he gets to this point where he gets really serious, and he says in chapter 2, he says, in fact, read it with me. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes, that ruined the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. And it's a super poetic book, and so he's, he's not just talking about literal foxes. He's teaching her something. But in this day, these foxes would kind of sneak in to their, to their vineyards, and they would eat the blossoms before any harvest could actually come. They would ruin the potential harvest. And so what he says to her as he's writing her these letters and encouraging her is make sure you catch those little foxes. Mom, make sure you take care of those little things. They're going to try to get in between us. They're going to try to steal from the harvest of our marriage. They're going to try to take away the, the little foxes. Let me give you some. The little fox of comparison. Right? We live in a digital age. It's so easy to look at hashtag relationship goals and see all the dates and all the fun and all the hand-holding, even though you didn't see the fight that led up to the picture. Right? You didn't see the millions of attempts to get the light just right on that. It's easy for you at, at work to say with the fox of comparison, you know, he's a lot nicer to me than my husband is. He can't, she pays way more attention. The way she laughs at my jokes, whew, I, little, little, little fox, I don't like the way you chew. I don't like the way you walk. I don't like the way you drive. I don't like the way you breathe. If, if they say that to you, just stop breathing on them. Just see what, they, fine. They'll, they'll stop, stop. Right? You're critical, you're controlling, you're passive, you're aggressive. These little foxes that get in, that, that may just seem like it's a surface thing, but no, that's the work of the enemy, trying to steal, kill, and destroy from your marriage. When we just allow culture to tell us how to treat each other, the enemy wants to get in with a little fox, not a, not a big hound that's going to announce his entry. No, little thing. Can I just plant a thought? Can, can I throw some temptation out there? Can it get you off course with the distraction? We said his other tactic would be seduction. I want to talk a little bit about sexual immorality. Because a recent article says that 60% of divorces are now citing pornography use as a leading cause of the divorce. See, sexual immorality has a way to just sneak in. Just, just a little bit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3 says, But among you... There must not be, say these three words with me, even a hint, even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity. Paul says there shouldn't be even a hint, just a little bit, right? We're not talking about the overwhelming, but, but just a small bit. If you're a believer in Christ, not even a hint. So I want to play a game with you because anyone here just felt the tension go up or just me, right? It's super awkward. We were just laughing about foxes. Now we're talking about sex, right? Wait, so let's play a game together. If you think that these scenarios have just a hint of sexual morality, then I'll know by your reactions that you agree with me, okay? So just a hint. If, if you're married and you were to start a relationship with someone on social media and then meet up to hook up, little hint, yeah, little hint, little hint, just a little, little hint, having sex with someone you're not married to. Okay, well, we're, we're not going to actually have sex with someone, but we're going we're gonna to engage in pornography. We're not going to be addicted to it. We can stop whenever we want, maybe one, two times a week on our phone, just a hint, little hint. I'm not going to actually watch pornography, but get me some Netflix originals where things are insinuated, where they're not showing anything, but, I mean, you know, they, they pan the scene fast enough. Is there a hint? Sexual immorality. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dress provocatively. I'm going to post some pictures. Hashtag blessed. 
right? right? Just, just, just a hint. Or I, I'm just, I'm, I'm not flirting. I'm just friendly, and we just, we just get along. We just jive, and we work in the same office together, and so it just kind of works out that, you know, we just, we just kind of. Not a hint. Paul says. Why? Because if we allow that little hint to get in, that little fox can seduce us, that little fox can distract us, then we are no longer devil kicking. In fact, we're being kicked pretty hard by the enemy. He's not going to show up with this big announcement, here I am, here it is, and you're going to avoid that. It's the not a hint moment. It's, it's the little fox. It's, it's the little thing. He wants to get in. It says, or of any kind of impurity. What is impurity? Impurity is poison. It, it kind of takes what's pure, and it mixes it in, and it makes it impure. Just stay, just, you don't want any of that. I love the words of the author of Proverbs, because when he thinks about the wicked way, about impurity, look at what his warning is to us. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. He says, avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. Kind of reminds me as a parent sometimes when you just like stammer out as many commands as you can. Right, pick up your toys, go to your room, wash your face, like whatever. Like. But for him right here, he's got the same command. He's saying four different ways because he's so adamant about it. If there is a line here and on the other side is immorality and impurity, the author is saying you need to avoid it, you don't travel on it, you turn from it, and you keep going on your own way. You don't just... What's going on over there? <laughs> Just a hint. No, you avoid it. You turn from it. And the reason why scripture is so strong when it comes to this is because we've talked about knowing the enemy. Now let's talk about the second knowing. You need to know yourself. Know the enemy. Know yourself. And what I really want you to understand about this knowing is that you need to know yourself. You need to know these things. You need to know your weaknesses and your weapons. It's too easy for all of us to sit in this space and say, well, I've got this. I'll never cross that line. Come on, I'm not going to go that far. Really, you're using these examples of the devil. I mean, not, I, no, no. You've got to know your weaknesses. Know those vulnerabilities because the enemy is going to attack you in your vulnerable positions. He's going to attack you where you're actually most vulnerable, not where you're standing strong. So you've got to know your weaknesses. And if he's going to leverage that to tempt you and seduce you, well, then you as a devil-kicking believer are going to say, I'm not going to put myself in a position of weakness where the enemy can get in. That, that's a decision that we make. It's called a pre-decision. I was talking to someone this past week. We were talking about guardrails, how the purpose of a guardrail is so that you won't even cross it to come onto oncoming traffic. You put it in place in your life so there's not even a chance of you going to the other side. Guardrails are great decisions. Let me give you some. If you know that you are extremely weak when it comes to pornography, well, then you don't carry around a smartphone anymore. You get yourself a dumb phone. Yeah, just, just buttons, no touch screen. I can make calls. That's it. Pastor, that's crazy. No, that's actually smart. Because you're saying, I know my weakness. I know the enemy is going to tempt me in this area. If there's someone at the office that's being a little over-friendly, you don't go out to have one-on-one -on -one lunch with that person. In fact, if it's too much, you ask your boss, hey, I need to move. Can I get moved to a different office? Can I go to a different cubicle here? No, you can't do that. All right, fine. I'm going to find me a new job. What? That's crazy. No, no, I care about my marriage. And I'm not going to cross that line. If you're vulnerable about the gym, you work out at home. But all of these things, and what I'm doing today is I want to just stir you and give you some ideas so that you might be devil kicking. Let me boil it down to this statement. Why fight a temptation in the future if you have the power to eliminate it today? Come on, you could amen there even more than Joe. Amen. Why would you fight in the future, if today, February 16th, 2020, you can make a decision to say, I'm not going to fight this later. I'm going to just get rid of it. There's not going to be a temptation because I'm going to remove it. And so I want to give you a question that we're going to talk about in group this week. If you're, if you're in a group, a sermon-based group, you're going to discuss this and have opportunity to encourage each other. Because I know what you're thinking. It's crazy. 
but it's okay. We don't want normal. No one wants a normal marriage, according to culture standards. We want Christ-centered. We want mission-driven. We want devil-kicking, so we got to get a little bit radical here. So think about this. Where are we currently most vulnerable to spiritual attacks? You have an area in your life right now, if you are married, where you are most vulnerable, where the enemy can most get in. It might be in the area of sexuality. It might be in the area of your finances. It might be in the area of your relationships. But there is an area where you know you have a weakness. We've all got them. I've got areas that I know I'm extremely weak in this area, and so I'm going to make sure I put up those guardrails so that I don't cross the line. So what is it? Where are you going to put in place some things so that you will not be most vulnerable to attacks? Now, it's easy to have two extreme responses to a message like this. The first response would be, that guy's crazy. I don't understand this. This is old school. This is radical. This is legalistic. If you're from a church culture, you might use that word. I, I don't need any of this. I'm good. I'm not going to fall. I've got this. That's, that's kind of one extreme response. Another extreme response be right now, you might feel so beat up. You might feel so ashamed. You might feel like you are screwed up and there is no way out. Two extreme responses. Paul addresses both of them in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 Verse 12 says, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. But if you think, I don't got to get rid of my, really, get rid of my phone, change my job, are you kidding me? I don't, I don't have to, just be careful, that's all, just be careful. Pride comes before a fall. It's so easy for us to feel like, I've got this, it's just a friendship, it's just a relationship, it's not going to go anywhere, and the enemy can get in with that little fox. But now to those of us that feel like, you don't understand how long I've been down this path. You don't understand how long I have been trapped in this. You don't understand how addicted I am. Look what he says. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. Meaning the enemy wants you to believe you're the only one struggling. You're not. Come on, you're not alone in this struggle. You are not the only one. It's common. Look at these next words. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Some of you feel like, no, I can't bear this. No, no, the word of God says he's not making it so hard that you can't bear it because look at the next phrase. But when you are tempted, because we all are, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. God is always going to provide a way out. He's never going to leave you in a situation where you feel like, I can't handle this, I can't get out of this, I can't make this decision, without you also saying, there's a way out. And that's our weapons. That's the things that God has put in our hands, because what do we read at the beginning? We don't fight against our spouse. We don't fight against our boss. We don't fight against our neighbor. No, no, we wrestle against principalities, rulers, authorities in dark places. So how do we fight those guys? Because I can't just learn some good moves, put them in a headlock, right? Here's six weapons. The word of God. One of the only offensive weapons that are listed in Ephesians chapter 6. Pick up the word of God and the sword of the spirit. I mean, be in scripture every single day. That way you know when there's something that is coming after you, you're immediately, no, no. No weapon formed against me will prosper. No greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. No, no, I seek God's kingdom first. He supplies all of my needs. That's the word of God. That's you going into spiritual warfare. Prayer. You seek God and pray. Paul says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things present your request to God. When the enemy's coming into your marriage, you pray. It's so easy for us to gossip. It's so easy for us to slander. It's so easy for us to argue. But God invites us to pray. We worship God. Do you know that when you begin just worshiping God, just worshiping his name, the atmosphere begins to shift where you are? Anyone believe that? Anyone ever experienced that before? I'm telling you, it's real hard to look at something you shouldn't be looking at while see a victory is playing on your computer. That's just a real practical guardrail. This is awkward. Jesus, you cool with this? Just let that sit for a second. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is powerful. The name above all names. Do you know that your own story and your own testimony, testimony is a way that you fight the enemy? In Revelation, we read that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb, it's the name of Jesus, and the word of our testimony. That when he starts reminding you of where you've been, you say, no, no, that's who I was. I'm a new creation in Christ now. The old is gone, the new has come. What if we started giving God thanks? 
What if we started saying to him, Lord, I just thank you for this relationship. I thank you for this moment, as opposed to complaining about our spouse and being critical about that person. Let me pause for a second, talk to the singles, because I know what you're thinking. This is an awesome Sunday for me to sit here and listen to you beat up on the married people. I'm loving this message. You horrible, horrible husbands and wives. Okay. For every person in this space, all of this applies. In fact, if you don't have a vision for your life today, and the enemy has already snuck into your life today, and he's already distracted you and seduced you with a little fox, maybe you've forgotten your first love, who is Jesus. Maybe you're rationalizing right now and saying, yeah, but I've got needs, and I'm just, I'm just having my needs met. No, no, your greatest need is for Jesus. And Pastor Amy said it in week one. Joe repeated it last week. You're going to hear it every single week. You do not build a life of righteousness in the future on a foundation of sin today. It's impossible. You cannot think that your addictions and your habits are going to be dealt with when you get married. You're just going to carry those into your marriage. Anyone here want to keep doing marriage counseling with me? Because this is pretty much what we do for 10 weeks leading up to a wedding. Because you're, you're not going to just take this stuff and bring it into a marriage and expect, oh, what's going to fix it is covenant. No, Jesus is going to fix your life. You are invited to come to him. In fact, the third knowing that Sun Tzu didn't speak about that we've got to understand here as we do spiritual warfare, you know your enemy, you know yourself, and somebody, you know God. Come on, the greatest knowing that you and I need is that we know God because apart from God, all you're going to feel is guilt and shame. If you don't know God, you are going to feel beat up right now. If you don't know his grace, you're going to hear this and the enemy's going to get in and he's going to twist it all and you're going to leave here saying, I'm never going back to that church. I'm not going to have relationships anymore. God hates me. He's upset with me. And that's why we've got to read this last scripture together because without this, the whole thing falls apart and the enemy just takes it all. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus was tempted. The enemy came to him and tried to distract and seduce. He did not sin. Okay, good for Jesus. What does that mean for us? The next verse. Let us then, in other words, in light of his perfection, here's what we do. We approach God's throne of grace ashamed, cowering, beat up, defeated, embarrassed. No, no. We approach his throne with confidence. Not self-confidence. God confidence. Not I've got this. You've got it. Jesus, you have to got it because I don't got it. And what do we receive? A good judgment, punishment, condemnation. No, no, that's the enemy. We receive mercy. We find grace to help us in our time of need. If you feel so beat up today from hearing about the standards of Scripture when it comes to sexual morality, it's because the enemy wants you to feel that. But your good father wants you to find help and grace and mercy. He wants you to find freedom. And so he says, come to me with confidence. Approach my throne. Don't, don't stay back. Don't feel like I can't. Today is a freedom day for so many people in this space where you are going to leave here and you are going to make a conscious decision. What are our values? That I'm Christ-centered, mission-driven, devil-kicking, and covenant keeping. Come on, say it with me. Get it in your heart. I am Christ-centered, mission-driven, devil-kicking, and covenant keeping. And I think it's worth giving God some praise right now so that we can begin battling the enemy. Come on, give him everything you have that he is the one who has defeated what you are facing. And I want to end by praying right now. And I want to pray some strong spiritual warfare prayers. And I'm going to invite you to be as honest as you can in this moment. You're either going to hold on with a tight grip or you're going to let go and confess to God and find healing today. Bow your heads with me. Father, I thank you so much that you care about us, that you don't leave us in our sin, leave us drowning, that you don't leave us to a culture standard, but you say, no, here's what it is. Not a hint. You provide a way out. You are the faithful God who is always for us and not against us. Right now as we're praying, I do believe that as I've been praying for this week, that there are going to be people in this space that you feel trapped, 
you feel nothing but condemnation. The enemy has so had his grips in you for so long, but you're saying, I want to find freedom. I want healing. If that's where you land, I want you to raise your hand. Everyone's heads are bowed. bowed. We're just saying to God, God, I want to find freedom. I want to find healing. I don't want to be condemned anymore. I don't want to feel guilt anymore. God, I'm approaching your throne of grace with confidence today. Father, I pray for those who right now are being so honest and so transparent and saying there are vulnerable positions. There are moments where I feel beat up. But God, we are coming to you as your word says with confidence in our hearts, asking to receive mercy and grace and to find help in our time of need. Lord, we come against the enemy right now. We declare his weapon is formed. It won't prosper in our lives in Jesus' name. That what he means for evil, you use for good. That while his plan is to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus, you said, I have come to bring life and bring it abundantly. And so I declare abundant life for these marriages. I declare abundant life for every person here. That we would catch a vision for our lives. That we wouldn't just float through life, but that we would have a clear plan. God, we are devil kicking. We are aware of our weakness, but we are so much more aware of the weapons. That we know you, God, and that we come to you in faith. And so, Lord, strengthen us this morning that we would trust in you, put our hope in you. God, bless our marriages as we choose to honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You might be here today and you don't know God. He's not the Lord of your life. He's not your Savior. You've never recognized that there is sin in your life and only Jesus can remove it. So I want to invite you to put your faith in him today. I want you to know that the same God who has invited the person sitting next to you has invited you invited the whole world to come to know him. You and I need a savior. So we're gonna pray together as a church. And if this is your first time, I want you to pray this and believe it, that you are saved. So let's pray this. Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus died and rose again so I could be forgiven. Thank you for new life. Today, I give you mine. In Jesus' name. Amen. Church, come on, we got to celebrate with people who are putting their hope in Jesus today. People who are saying, I'm putting my faith in him. He is the Lord of my life. And if you made a decision to follow him, there's a blue connect card and there's a spot that says, I'm following Jesus, decided to follow him. Before you leave, take that card, drop it in a box or bring it to our connect corner because we want to celebrate with you. Right now, I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to sing a song about the powerful, wonderful name of Jesus Christ. And so let's declare this as our spiritual warfare song.